The Mystical Evolution in the Development and Vitality of the Church, Part 21. In the purgative phase, the type of prayer by which souls are generally illumined and inflamed with the love of God, at the same time that they strive to purify, deny, and conquer themselves, is discursive prayer or meditation. In that type of prayer, the words of the psalmist are fulfilled. Quote, In my meditation a fire shall flame out. Unquote. In the illuminative way, discursive prayer is generally useless to the soul and sometimes proves an obstacle. The soul is illumined and inflamed, and at the same time much better purified by letting itself be gently led by the motions and inflamed in the flames of love which, without their knowing how, are springing up in their heart, because the Holy Ghost secretly communicates them. Such prayer is almost entirely effective, or, as is said, the prayer of affection or supplication, which terminates in a certain loving vision which is in reality a mixture, as it were, of meditation and contemplation. In that state, the soul scarcely does more than burn with the affections which has provoked or which the Holy Spirit has suggested to it, or aroused in it. Finally, in the unitive way, those divine motions and illuminations dominate to such an extent that prayer is changed, so to speak, into habitual contemplation. Mysticism, then, without ascetical practices, is a vanity and an illusion, and asceticism without mystical introspections pious affections and ardent inspirations for true union with God can almost be regarded as time wasted. It is work without fruit, navigation without a port, a body without a soul, the letter without the spirit. It can be reduced to a series of routine exercises which feed but do not vivify. True mysticism always advances with the help of asceticism in continual abnegation, carrying the cross with Christ and for Christ. And this cross is for enamored souls at the same time a bundle of myrrh and a cluster of cypress. On the other hand, asceticism is entirely subordinated to mysticism. By means of privations and holy practices performed in spirit and in truth, it seeks the secret gift of God and the precious pearl of his kingdom in the depths of our hearts. The contemplative soul is a pillar of smoke of aromatical spices, of myrrh and frankincense, and of all the powders of the perfumer. And the ascetic begs its sweetest savior to draw it so that it will run after him to the odor of his ointments. Jesus Christ is at once the way, the truth, and the life. Following his bloody footsteps, we become illumined with the light of his truth. For, quote, he that doth truth cometh to the light, unquote. And he follows Christ, quote, walketh not in darkness, but shall have the light of life, unquote. By means of that life-giving light, we see through an intimate experience that Jesus is our life. Quote, For me, to live is Christ. Unquote. Thus, faithful Ill imitation leads infallible to the full illumination of the mystical union. Jesus Christ is not divided, although he manifests himself only by degrees, first as the way and the model, and later as the absolute truth and light of revelation, and finally as the fullness of life, he is always at once our all, the way, the truth, and the life. He is the model of all men as the divine exemplar and splendor of the glory of the Father, the light for the revelation of the Gentiles, 
the power and wisdom of God, and the word of life which appeared among us full of grace and truth, so that we all might receive of his fullness. In him is the life that the light of men. If, then, we encircle our body with the mortification of Jesus, it is so that the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. And if we die to the world and to ourselves, it is that our life may be hidden with Christ in God. St. Catherine of Siena says, quote, We cannot have fire without blood, nor blood without fire. That is to say, there is no perfect charity without sacrifices and mortification, and there is no spirit of sacrifice without true charity, which is the divine fire which illumines and vivifies and unites the soul to God. He who is the Son of Truth hears the voice of Jesus, and this voice calls to all. If, quote, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth in me, as the scripture saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Unquote. Quote, come to me, all you that labor and are burdened, and I will refresh you. Take up my yoke upon you, and you shall find rest to your souls. Unquote. We know that divine wisdom invites all the little ones. But if we do not truly convert ourselves and become as children in simplicity and innocence, so that we may be docile to the voice of truth, if we do not have a true hunger and thirst for justice, as newborn babes desiring the rational milk in order to grow into salvation in Jesus Christ, and to grow into the stature of the perfect man, if, finally, we do not take up the cross of Jesus and learn of him meekness and humility, we shall never succeed in entering by the narrow gate the mystical kingdom of God, which is within us, nor shall we ever find rest for our souls. He who does not take up his cross lovingly and follow the Savior is not worthy of him. If, then, we have not yet had the good fortune to find the hidden treasure. Let us not place the blame on anyone, but rather on our own listlessness in searching for that treasure. Let us not try to justify our spiritual weakness, our negligences, and lukewarmness by the specious argument of not having been called. Let us, rather, examine our breast and probe our wounds and we shall discover the true causes for not having heard the divine voice, the hardness of our hearts, attachments to our own judgments, our rebellious will, our own tastes and attachments, our, obst our obstinate aversion to the cross and the humiliations of Jesus Christ, our continual resistance to the sweet invitations of his loving spirit, and our flight from that mystical solitude to which he desires to lead us in order to speak to our hearts. Let us frankly confess these sorrowful facts and let us reform our lives in order to truly follow Jesus and be docile to his spirit, thus to find rest in the ineffable delights of his kingdom, which are so little known and therefore so little appreciated and sought after by those who walk to perdition in search of vanities and passing shadows. Meanwhile, let us not aggravate our evil and that of many other souls by many vain excuses. Let us not turn our excuses into false doctrines and harmful counsels, thereby closing with lamentable superficiality and imprudence the gate of those gifts to fervent souls that follow after the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ, who sweetly captivates all who have a clean heart and healthy senses. Our obligation as his ministers is not only to invite and encourage such souls, but to oblige them to enter into the great banquet of the nuptials of the Lamb, compel them to enter. <laughs> 
If we act otherwise, we are traitors, or at least disloyal servants, depriving him of the delights he finds in dwelling with the sons of men. Meanwhile, he himself is incessantly knocking at the doors to enter and to celebrate the mystical banquet. Quote, Behold, I stand at the gate and knock. If any man shall hear my voice and open to me the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Unquote. Quote, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. And the Spirit of the Bride says, Come. And he that heareth, let him say, Come. And he that thirsteth, let him come. And that he that will, let him take the water of life freely. Come, Lord Jesus. Unquote. Many souls do not ne- heed that sweet voice. They do not enter into themselves and dispose themselves to hear it by saying with the psalmist, quote, I will hear what the Lord God will speak in me, for he will speak peace unto his people. Unquote. And they do not have their thoughts fixed on his holy commandments and their eyes on his path. They do not arouse in themselves the desire to drink the mystical living water. Therefore, and not for any other empty reasons, as Blosius observes, there are so few contemplative and so many who do not even know that intimate depth of the soul where the Lord has his kingdom, to which he invites us to converse with him and to satiate ourselves in the fount of eternal life. They fear this wisdom because it appears to them to be hard and difficult, Intimidated, they judge that it is not for them, and thus they lose the peace and happiness reserved for those who persevere. Some prudent and respected authors seek to avoid the excesses of false mysticism and of illusioned and presumptuous souls who wish to fly without wings and rise to the heights of contemplation without passing through the difficult struggles of meditation and other exercises and trials of the ascetic life. With this purpose in mind, these authors deem it opportune to insist on the importance of asceticism and also presume and often prescind from the lofty questions of mysticism which pertain only to the proficient souls. But that tendency, like so many others, has passed beyond what is fitting, It has established a complete separation between asceticism and mysticism, with grave detriment to both. For actually, they should mutually aid each other. This tendency has succeeded in discrediting many books which should have contributed and could have contributed towards much the sanctification of souls. From this follows the many evil which Father Kassad rightly laments, and which are the natural effects of the prejudices that existed even in the time of St. Teresa, and caused her much distress. The study of mysticism was abandoned as if it were something dangerous, and the books which treated of it were taken from the hands of spiritual persons who were very much in need of them. There were even some who, with the greatest reluctance, permitted such reading to those who themselves were to become directors of souls, thus systematically making them, quote, the blind leading the blind, unquote. The result was a general forgetfulness of the science of the saints, if not, indeed, a positive disdain for the knowledge of the ways of the Lord, to whom they were saying implicitly, Quote, depart from us, we desire not the knowledge of thy ways. Unquote. Persons who acted thus were like those rejected ones of whom Ossie spoke, who could not help but become destroyers instead of builders. Not finding in the mouths of so many priests of God the knowledge which they had a right to expect, many souls who otherwise would have arrived at the great heights, were led astray, remained stationary, or retrogressed. 
The fault was also theirs in part because they knew not how to persevere, because they did not heed the Father of lights and fervently ask for the spirit of counsel, fortitude, and wisdom, who could have led them sweetly and freed them from deception. But the majority, if they should have had the good fortune to find a competent director, would have avoided that delusion and would have found the light and counsel they needed. Where there is a good direction and stimulus to the holy examples of sound books of mysticism, contemplative souls abound. But the majority, if they should have had the good fortune to find a competent director, would have avoided that delusion and they would have found the light and counsel they needed. Where there is a good direction and stimulus of holy examples and sound books on mysticism, contemplative souls abound. Where these advantages are lacking, such souls are extremely rare. Only a few souls who are much stronger and who are able to navigate against the wind and the current succeed in reaching the heights. Thus, 99%, says Father Godinius, are wrecked in various phases of trial. It is well known how much poor directors impeded St. Teresa, whereas most of her disciples, as, for example, St. Jane Francis de Chantal, entered quickly into the heights of contemplation. Why did not so many other souls enter who were filled with holy desires? Because they lacked the light, the direction, the example, the stimulus, or the aid which they normally required. It is not in vain that the Apostle desires and charges us not to ignore spiritual things, but that we should appreciate them well and even desire to and strive to procure them and despire for our own betterment and the edification of the church, for the greatest of the charisms. The result of the total separation of mysticism from asceticism is the belief that only the latter is of importance to us, and that we have no reason to aspire to the heroic virtues of the great contemplatives, nor feel that we have a vocation to ascend to such heights. But what saint is there who, at least at the end of this life, was not in his own way a contemplative. And what Christian is there who is not obliged to imitate the perfection, not only of the great saints, but of the Heavenly Father himself? We have seen that contemplation is both desirable and attainable. We are all called to it, and we should all aspire to it, for the very reason that it is recommended to us and offered to us as a crown of ordinary prayer in the ascetical life, there can be no complete separation between asceticism and mysticism. But today we see many who obstinately separated these two phases in theory and then later in practice confuse them so excessively and unfortunately that they call mystical what is in reality only the rudiments of asceticism. Thus they label as mystics any souls that try to avoid dissipation, laxity, and slothfulness. They themselves shun mysticism as something superior and extraordinary, to which they do not think themselves called. They end up in being neither the one nor the other, without mysticism or asceticism. They desire to be considered very good Christians, exemplary priests, or model religious but actually they are completely mundane. It could not be otherwise, since they separate what is essentially one and they divide the unity of Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He who does not strive to live united with Christ, who does not imitate him as he ought, will never truly know him and will despise his truth. He who does not aspire to true sanctification which is found in the mystical union with Christ, that is, in living a life that is totally vivified and directed by the Holy Ghost, will never be a good Christian in the true sense. <laughs>
So we see that modern asceticism, which caters to the indolent and those who disdain mysticism and mystics, is, as Father Weiss says, nothing other than philosophy of a life of comfort. The great masters of earlier times made no distinction between asceticism and mysticism, for to them the former was the foundation of the latter. For that reason they used the two names indiscriminately. They would counsel the ascetic or beginner to practice holy introspection in order to prepare himself to enter into the secret contemplation, and they would command the contemplative to proceed as the perfect ascetic. Blosius follows this same line of thought when he observes, All should aspire to perfection and the mystical union. They are much to be pitied, who, preoccupied with sensible things, spend their whole lives on external exercises and are forgetful of the center of their soul, that the blessed union with God, they say with their heart, if not with their words, Quote, let him who wishes to unite himself to him. We do not care for that because we do not feel so inclined. Unquote. Exterior practices are good and pleasing to God, but more valuable beyond compare are internal exercises, the fervent desires whereby the soul is directed to God, not by sense impressions and images, but in a supernatural manner so that it may be intimately united with him. Those who despise this union will have much to suffer in purgatory. God desires to work in them, and he waits to see whether he will find them disposed and free of obstacles. Meanwhile, he leaves them to their exercises and opinions because he does not wish to force anyone. He wishes to draw them all to his knowledge and unite himself with them if they do not prevent him. He takes it very ill that we are content with so little when there is so much that he wishes to give us, for he desires to give us himself, and that in a most excellent manner. How great, then, is our blindness and indolence, we who have been made to enjoy God, to know the abyss of his goodness even in this exile, and are be united with him in such a manner that we shall begin to taste our future happiness. Let us not excuse our slothfulness and laxity under the vain pretext that we are not called to those extraordinary ways. For God calls all of us to his sweet rest. Therefore let us not imitate the Pharisees and close the gates of the kingdom to others because of our pseudo-ascetical doctrines, besides resolving not to enter ourselves. There is only one asceticism, and, and this is the one which teaches us to deny ourselves and embrace the cross of Christ in order to be despoiled of our vileness and configured and united to him. He who truly does this will receive the hundredfold in this life and sooner or later will enter into intimate union and communication with God. Today, unfortunately, now that the centuries-old error in this matter which cater to the slothful, utilitarian, and lazy, is recognized. There is a definite attempt to remedy it. Thus we see a marvelous rebirth of mystical studies which are now judged indispensable for the good direction of all pious souls, for the one's own spiritual progress. The Review Tomiste of March 1907, says in this regard, The mystical life is the normal crowning of the Christian life. Every Christian here below ought to tend to a life of perfect union with God, and the life of union is the mystical life. This life is offered to all, though few attain it. But it is to be believed that many fervent Christians do attain to the lower grades, the mystical state is, then, an eminent grace and greatly to be desired. It is beginning to be manifested much earlier than is commonly believed. The mystical state is not usually habitual, except in souls that have reached the perfection of the unitive way.
But even in the illuminative way, and sometimes in the purgative way, the soul that is faithful to grace works mystically from time to time. How is it possible, actually, that the gifts of the Holy Ghost could remain inactive in the soul, simply as habits, without performing any acts, until the unitive state? In the preface to La Vie avec Dieu by Peter Fossilian, Father Schwalm says, Contemplation enters into the normal development of virtue in the Christian life. It is not, of course, the general state of souls and grace, but the peak to which they tend by the good exercise of the virtues. It is the effect of triumphant divine love. The Dominican mystics were unanimous in arousing the desire for this grace, but it is not merely a tradition of the school. It is a doctrine shared with St. Bonaventure, St. Bernard, Richard and Hugh and St. Victor, Cassian, and Saints Gregory the Great. The fathers of the church had shown them the way. Taller, Suso, and St. Catherine of Siena deduced practical conclusions and showed their readers how to dispose themselves to receive the gift of contemplation joyfully considering it an obligation to f attract fervent souls to it. We can terminate this discussion by stating categorically with Father Weiss, quote, Mysticism is truly the flower and terminus of the Christian life. It is Christianity in its full development. Therefore, it is the concern of all who wish to accept Christianity in its fullness. Mysticism is for all. To withdraw oneself from its obligation is to disregard one's salvation. There is no condition, state, or occupation which authorizes anyone to say that mysticism does not concern him. Unquote. The Mystical Question so intermingled with asceticism and mysticism and so difficult is to distinguish them with the precision and characterize them that to assign each uh, its true deferential characteristics has become the object of lively discussion. It is to be hoped that such discussions will be productive of practical conclusions. What is disputed in the mystical question is the true concept under which we should formulate about the mystical state and the de definition which most properly fits it. Once its constitutive elements are known, one can better discover whether it is frequent, attainable, and desirable how we ought to dispose of ourselves to reach it. This, of course in a practical way, is of the greatest interest. The complete mystical and ascetical states are sufficiently distinguished by the provisional definitions we gave at the beginning of this book. We said that asceticism is the theoretico-practical science of the ordinary ways of Christian perfection in which the supernatural life is lived as yet unconsciously and modo humano. Mysticism, on the other hand, is the experimental science of the extraordinary or supernatural ways in which that life is lived more or less consciously and supramodum humanum. According to these definitions, the difference appears to be great and does not allow for any confusion of the full and complete states of their characteristics. Yet, when these things are studied more profoundly, it is discovered that there is no discontinuity, no diversity, but a perfect unity, a blending of the whole long series of gradual transitions between the two states, which, at first sight, seem quite unconnected. If, a, if in human life there is a perfect continuity, from the unconscious state of early infancy to the full consciousness of the adult age, it is no less evident in the corresponding successive states of the supernatural life, 
This is true to such an extent that it is impossible to identify the precise moment at which the one terminates and the other begins. In reality, the life of grace is a complete unity, from the pouring of the baptismal waters until the full expansion on the eternal shores. Actually, no one would deliberately attempt to say when the ascetical state ends and when the mystical state begins, because, in truth, the ascetical state cannot and should not cease entirely. Further, the mystical state does not begin with the termination of the ascetical state, but during it. At most, there is a preponderance of the one and lessening of the other. In the period of purgation, there is a predominance of the activity of ascetical initiative. In the state of union, the passivity of trusting abandonment or the gentleness of the sweet mystical repose, but in the phase of illumination or advancement, there is a compenetration and sometimes an alteration of these two states. Therefore, when the breathing of the Divine Spirit ceases, or is lacking, the soul should, contrary to what is taught by the quietists, make use, as much as lies in its power, of all the ordinary recourses, occupying itself in meditation, spiritual reading, particular examination, holy affections, and the various exercises of the active life until it again experiences the divine motion and finds the repose of contemplation. Sadru, who rightly considered asceticism the preparation for the mystical state, and therefore ardently defends the view that the mystical state is attainable and desirable, characterizes it in all its phases by two elements, a superior but confused knowledge, and an intense but semi-conscious love, or a logo, as the ancients would say. These are the only two things which he regards as essential elements in the whole process of the mystical life. The rest he considers nothing more than accessories. He says, quote, There are, in any mystical state, these two elements, a superior knowledge of God which, though general and confused, give a lofty idea of his incomprehensible grandeur, and a non-rationalized but intense love, communicated by God himself, a love which the soul could never attain by its own powers. But these two characteristics are constitutive elements, only so far as they are perfect, and not in regard to their imperfect or confused forms. In the latter state, they characterize only the beginnings of the mystical state and the phases of aridity and obscurity. But when the gifts of wisdom and understanding are manifested in a very high degree in soul, by a clear intellectual vision, perceives the divine attributes and, loving with all his strength, laments that it cannot love God as it sees what he deserves to be loved, its love is no longer a logo, nor is it knowledge confused. But the summit of the mystical state is much higher. One cannot, then, consider as merely accessory that which is manifested and made more and more secure with progressive development Although sometimes, in periods of trial or des desolation, it seems to be hidden. Only the particular phenomena of each phase, which later disappear into new ones, merit this qualification. But what is manifested, actually, in any phase, having begun virtually in a preceding phase and persistently eminently in a succeeding phase, belong to the very essence of the mystical life. Bolestikes, recognizing that mysticism can be defined as the experimental science of God, more accurately states that this science consists of a mysterious knowledge and love which enables us to perceive God in a truly ineffable manner. <clears throat> 
and which is an effect of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. Hence, the more ineffable the knowledge and love, the more positive and elevated they are, for they presuppose a very lofty communication of the gifts. Likewise, the better these communications are experienced, the worse they are expressed, because they do not fall into human words. Paulain, who believes in an essential distinction between mysticism and asceticism, and thinks that the ascetical state can reach to the prayer of simplicity, characterizes the mystical state, or rather, quote, the common basis of all the grades of the mystical union, unquote, as a certain spiritual sensation, like an interior touch, of the presence of God. But in this there is contained only the cog cognoscitive element and not the affective element, which is equally, if not more, important. Moreover, as Sadru replies, that presence is not perceived in the night of the senses, which, according to Paulain himself, and also St. John of the Cross and Father Serene, belongs to the mystical state Finally, if the spirit of simplicity leads, as he himself admits, <clears throat> quote, as on a smooth incline to the mystical state, unquote, it is because there is no discontinuity between the two states, and that prayer is partly acquired and partly infused, for it would not offer the sweetness which is had in the loving presence of God without a higher impulse of the spirit of piety and wisdom. Thus, already in the prayer of simplicity or of simple attention or loving gaze, there should be a certain divine contact, taste, and odor, though the soul is unaware of them. Later, in the night of the senses, later, in the night of the senses, there is a change of aspect and intensity in these spiritual senses, and they are felt as privations because of the aridity, distaste, and annoyance, which result from a strong divine action which is painful for the soul, yet not yet purified or disposed to receive it with pleasure. In reality, what constitutes the mystical state is the predominance of the gifts and their effects, the fruits of the Holy Ghost, over ordinary living faith and the corresponding works of hope and charity, while the predominance of the latter over the former constitutes and, to a certain extent, characterizes the ascetical state. But sometimes the ascetic, moved by the divine spirit, can work in an entirely mystical manner, though he does not advert to it. On the other hand, when the Holy Ghost temporarily departs from the mystics, although they may be very elevated and enriched with his great efforts and fruits, which give all their acts greater intensity and value, they must, to a certain extent, proceed after the manner of ascetics. The gifts are infused, as we have seen, with sanctifying grace, and they grow in proportion as charity grows. As Father Weiss observes, the gifts are necessary not only to arrive at true sanctity and to be able to perform certain difficult actions, but also to practice the Christian virtues which the required perfection and even to attain salvation. By means of the gifts, all the faithful who live in grace can sometimes work heroically and mystically. So, in the very dawn of the spiritual life, the mystical life has begun although in a very remiss state. In reality, the mystical state comprises the whole development of the Christian life and the entire way of evangelical perfection, however much its principal manifestations were, are reserved for the unitive way in which the soul possesses, as it were, the habit of heroism and of the divine and exercising itself perfectly in the most difficult acts of virtue, it works clearly supra modum humanum, 
In the purgative way, and even to some extent in the illuminative way, the soul, struggling with difficulties, overcoming obstacles and avoiding impediments, must work by the light of faith under its own initiative in a human manner, modo humano. Without experiencing very clearly, or at least without knowing that it feels, the hidden motion of the consoler and the taste, sweet or bitter, he infuses with it in the gift of wisdom. For since this taste or fervor is of yet sensible, being manifested in the interior rather than the superior part of the soul, although at times it is perceived clearly, whether it is divine or natural, is not yet clearly recognized. From time to time, in the midst of the efforts, the faithful soul perceives certain impulses or delicate attractions and certain tastes or distastes in which it distinguishes, recognizes, or at least suspects of mysterious divine odor or taste. When the soul advances in the interior ways and the fruits of life with it, the motion leaves in it, cannot help but recognize the special impulse of the Holy Ghost. So the soul, which as yet proceeds along the ordinary paths sometimes, produces truly mystical acts, just as the mystic on many occasions produces ascetical acts and the mystical acts are gradually increased until the soul is purified and illumined, and then they become almost habitual. When this happens, when the soul habitually produces heroic acts of virtue and dead to self and offering no resistance, lets itself be moved by the impulses, touches, and breathings of the spirit, who, as on a delicate musical instrument, strokes the soul at his pleasure and draws from it divine melodies, St. Gregory Nancyanzen. Then we can say that the soul is fully in the mystical state, although at times it must still descend to the ascetical state. The habitual mystical state begins fully with the prayer of union, although there are still great interruptions until the soul reaches the full and stable union. But the mystical state is initiated in the effective prayer, and then, in the night of the senses, however much the soul is unable to recognize the fact, it is accentuated more and more. This is marked on the one hand by the increasing difficulty or impossibility of meditating on the ordinary way, and on the other hand by the continual vision of the loving or painful presence of God. Then it will be manifested clearly, although briefly and at great intervals, in the state of infused recollection, and much better or more so in the prayer of quiet, these are already mystical states, but short and interrupted, and therefore many authors are accustomed to identify the mystical life with union regarding the other phases merely as, as preparations. Since the time of St. Teresa, all the successive phases which follow after a person begins clearly to experience supernatural or infused prayer which he can never attain by ordinary means, no matter how much he may try, in which the soul must be governed by other laws, which are far superior to those of the habitual ascetic, are considered as belonging to the mystical state. The saint saw that this new manner of prayer was verified in the prayer of recollection, which was therefore called infused. This differs from the uh, prayer acquired by our own efforts, which costs much labor and is much inferior and less fruitful, whereas infused prayer, as a work proper to the Holy Ghost, is effected without any effort, and sometimes when it is least expected, it is always most profitable. Since the Spirit breathes where he will, without our knowing whence he comes or whither he goes, some receive this prayer very early and with great frequency, and others, more retarded souls, very late and at long intervals. But if souls do not come correspond well, then even though they have experienced this habitual prayer, 
the Holy Ghost withdraws from them for a time, or for many years, or sometimes permanently. During these absences, the loving soul, which knows through experience the caresses of the Beloved, tries unceasingly to find him in the streets and broad ways, that is to say, in the ordinary works of the active life, in every type of ascetical practice, but especially in prayer and frequent aspirations and introspections. The soul asks for him from the keepers of the city, its spiritual directors, and if the soul is very perfect, then God, instead of consoling and directing the soul, will permit it to be tormented and despoiled of its veil of good reputation, disconcerting it and even discrediting it. But if the soul remains faithful in seeking him, it will not be long in finding him in the flowery garden of its heart, and will communicate itself to him more than ever. And when the soul is not yet strong enough to endure such trials, there will not be lacking those who will teach it how to find him. Quote, when I had little passed by them, I found him who my soul loveth. Unquote. These absences and delays, which at times def definitive, owing to the lack of fidelity and diligence in seeking him, have made souls believe that he communicates himself mystically only to certain privileged persons and not to others, however good they may be. But such souls should examine their consciences well and consider their weakness and infidelities, their deafness to divine inspirations, their slothfulness and lack of perseverance during the obscurities in seeking him on the couch of prayer, and when unable to find him in prayer, called at the same time on works of charity and mercy. Having done this, they will understand that they are not numbered in a small group of the Chosen One. It is not because they do not belong to the many who have called, for all those who thirst have been called. So the true ascetical life tends of itself to the mystical life as to its flower and crowning. There is a gradual transition from the one to the other. The faithful ascetic, under the unconscious or unexpected impulses of the Divine Consoler, practices this mystical act more and more until, purified in the shadow of him whom it desires, that wisdom does not enter into a malicious soul, nor dwell in a body subject to sin, manifests itself clearly and brings the soul into the storerooms and even in the wine cellar to set in order charity in the soul. When this infused prayer begins, the mystical and ascetical states are intermingled and at times fused until the prayer of union. The mystical state predominates. In the espousal it becomes habitual, and later it becomes permanent. But that which is noted clearly and positively in the prayer of recollection was already indicated amid the contrary effects of the night which precedes it, and prepared for us, and for it just as will be again, noted the obscurities, arities, desolations, bitterness, fear, trials, and other painful and extraordinary sensations which follow it. It is precisely these conditions that the soul usually performs heroic acts, which, as true fru fruits of the divine spirit, testify to the presence of his gifts. There the soul exercises fortitude, piety, counsel, and fear, and it gathers from them the fruits of patience, logananimity, faith, continence, goodness, meekness, and so on. They lead the soul to joy amid tribulations, to peace amid contradictions, and struggles into true chastity modesty, even benignity, and finally, to perfect charity, which casts out all servile fears. Thereby the soul attains a higher degree of the gift of knowledge, learning in its trials to know God better, seeing his paternal hand even in the most subtle malice of creatures, 
and requiring the new hunger and thirst for justice. It also possesses in a higher degree the gift of understanding, by which the, through the darkness it discovers and penetrates the divine secrets. Finally, there is an increase of the gift of wisdom which formerly saturates the soul with salutary bitterness in order to purify it and enable it to taste the ineffable sweetness of the God of all consolation. Thus, what is truly characteristic of the mystical state, either in act or in habit, is the superhuman mode which is realized and recognized in prayer by some special manifestation of the lights and affections produced through the various gifts of the Holy Ghost, in operation by some noticeable acquisition of the twelve fruits, in knowledge and volition by some positive or negative, pleasing or displeasing, function of the spiritual senses and sentiments, that is, of the various conscious forms of the sensus Christi, which make us perceive, appreciate, love, and desire God ineffably. There is also other special manifestations of the gifts of understanding, knowledge, and wisdom, and so on. In all this, the soul manifests itself, as directed and moved by the Holy Ghost, proceeding in a superhuman manner under the divine initiative and according to divine norms, in the ascetical state, the soul proceeds humanly, under the government of reason itself, more or less Christianized and as if by its own initiative. Sometimes the soul believes that it does not feel God, that it does not appreciate him, love him, or follow his impulses, and in all this because of the aridity, bitterness, and difficulties which it encounters, but it does not feel at least the painful emptiness of his absence, an ardent thirst for his love, and for the painful awareness of its own ugliness and weakness by means of the secret divine light which discloses these things. What is essential in some special motion or illumination of the paraclete, although it may be so dissimulated that it will hardly be noticed? Nevertheless, it will be accepted and felt as a kind of interior touch which is most spiritual, and however much the soul may believe that it is not experiencing it, it is working under the influence unconsciously. Thus, under the secret touch of God, the soul sometimes finds itself moved and directed without knowing how or whence. It is moved to love or fear intensely, but it knows not why. So it is that many mystics speak with full conviction that sometimes they love without understanding, and all mystics in general maintain that the very least that love goes much farther than knowledge and exceeds it beyond compare. Meanwhile, purely speculative theologians, not understanding these mysteries, reply to this by invoking the axon, nihil volitum, quin precognitum. But here, the one who knows is the Holy Ghost, who breathes where he will, and without our knowing where he goes, who pours his divine charity into our hearts in order to inflame them with his sweet fire without being aware of it. He pleads for us with unspeakable groanings for that for which we know not how to ask. The greater part of his ordinary inspirations are realized unconsciously, working as if by instinct, that is, by a true divine instinct, as St. Thomas calls it. The soul feels moved by a vivid desire without knowing why, and in many times it works without having more than a vague idea than the object of proposed and so our working well ultimately reduces itself to letting ourselves be carried by that sweet breathing and cooperating faithfully, and without the least resistance with the mysterious impulse which we experience for the supreme good. This sensation of the divine is what makes us recognize ourselves, 
as partakers with all the faithful, so that we personally and truly grieve over their spiritual losses and rejoice in their gains. We note, though unconsciously, that they pertain in some way to the whole organism of the mystical body in which any experience of any member constitutes a true progress. From this proceeds the mutual and mysterious influence of the one on the other and the fact that the measure that the unity, union, charity, and holy solidarity increases among many, there is also increased in them, as Moeller notes, illumination, so that they are much better able to know the head together than they would separately. But this is also follows that great certain great saints, even though they had never met before, readily recognized each other and contracted in intimate spiritual friendships. They are organs which form a part of the most pure heart of the church wherein the great guest dwells in a singular manner, finding his delight there and pouring forth the torrent of his graces so that through these organs, as though as through a network whose mesh extends throughout the whole world, it may seek and captivate another multitude of souls. Hence, in the measure that the perfection of a Christian increases, so also does his charity and solidarity with all Christians grow. He feels himself more bound to them as member of Christ and is much more vitally interested in each one of his neighbors. He has a greater influence on the common good as he contributes to an extraordinary manner to the edification of the Church of Christ in charity and to the evolution of the Church in all forms and of its progressive development. <laughs>